Welcome back to another beautiful day in Western Asia. So today we are going to be looking a bit more, actually I should say a lot more, at the Achaemenid Empire, uh, specifically during the reign of Darius I. But before we get to that, we need to speak a little bit more about the exam. Exam 2, Electric Boogaloo. I don't know why I put that in there. Um, <laughs> It's pretty funny. Uh, anyway, anyway, so there's going to be an example. Oh, I did it again. I did two jokes in one slide. That's incredible. It's a record for me. Anyway, there's going to be an example online that uh, is going to show you basically the exact format of the real exam. So it'll have um, samples of basically each of the three sections. So the matching section, the short answer section, and the essay section of which you already know. Uh, I'm going to upload a little bit of information uh, as well with that exam, uh, so you'll be able to, to better understand uh, what's going to be going on. Uh, the next thing that I want to announce is that while we will be covering the Scythians, uh, which is scheduled for, let me grab the under here, which is scheduled for 11.2, uh, we will be covering them, but uh, I'm not going to make you know them for the exam. Uh, I totally forgot to, to mention that. Um, so they're on the, uh, on the study guide, but you don't need to know them for the exam because they're not going to be on there. But we still will learn a little bit about those funny capped Scythians, as we will see a little bit later on. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be located in the course documents uh, right next to the study guide. So again, just to, to reiterate, no Scythians, and there will be an example on the on the, the canvas page uh, when you uh, when you get done watching this lecture. So a little bit of a reminder of where exactly we are. Uh, we were first in Pasargadai down here in central Fars province, Iran, and we will be moving over to Persepolis uh, for a bit. But first, we're going to make a stop off up in the modern Kerman Shah province of Iran, which is right up in here. And we're going to be looking at <clears throat> one of the most fascinating uh, rock reliefs uh, to have almost ever existed. Uh, it's incredibly cool, so I'm really excited for us to, to get to it. Uh, but first, let us talk a little bit about royal names. So there was a question in the discussion uh, posts from however many lectures ago now uh, about the, uh, the names of certain kings. And this was uh, specifically to do with like Ashur Nasirpal and the like and Shalmaneser. Uh, so uh, here is a bit about uh, the Achaemenid names. So uh, Darius, who we will be looking at today, or Deryavaush, uh, is uh, translated roughly into English as one who holds firm the good. Uh, and we'll see this idea of the good uh, particularly come up uh, more and more and more. Uh, as we spoke about in the previous lecture, I believe, or two lectures ago, uh, the Zoroastrian idea of good or truth over evil lie. Uh, that is a, a very much a defining factor uh, of the Achaemenid state, and we'll definitely see that uh, come up uh, time and time again as we, uh, as we get a little bit more deeper into the inscriptions that Darius made. Now, Xerxes, hero among kings, uh, also has a Sanskrit parallel, uh, and, what's, and Artaxerxes, who is also um, uh, one of the Achaemenid kings. Now, the really fascinating thing about Artaxerxes and Xerxes, uh, Arta is also uh, can be translated not just as uh, just, but as truth. So again, we get to that idea of truth versus lie. Uh, so uh, whose kingdom is truth or whose kingdom is true. And what's really fascinating is that the Sasanian names, so the next great Persian empire after the Seleucids and the Parthians, uh, the founder of the Sasanian empire, uh, Ardakshir, comes directly uh, from the same lineage 
uh, linguistic lineage as Artaxerxes. Uh, and we'll discuss that a little bit more when we get to the Sasanians, but they're still a long way off. So a little bit more about kind of the, the change between Cyrus and uh, Darius. So Cyrus took his title as the ruler of Anshan, just like the Elamites. Uh, Cyrus came from, from this Perso-Elamite elite. So he was very much part of the uh, Elamite family uh, of, of royalty that we discussed a bit with Chogazan Beel and Susa. So Darius the first uh, comes in, and he was actually an usurper to the throne. Uh, and from what we can tell is that he actually killed Cyrus's son to take the throne. Uh, and Darius, uh, as it says here, he represents a branch of the Persian elite that um, was very much so associated with this Aryan idea. So that idea of Iranianness that was separate from the Elamites and the Medes. Uh, so he is coming up with this kind of different way in, and as we'll see very shortly, uh, exactly how he does that. Uh, and of course, this is where we see the, the explosion of Ahura Mazda. So under Cyrus, Ahura Mazda really doesn't make any sort of appearance. Uh, but when we get into the uh, reign of Darius I, Ahura Mazda, the great Zoroastrian god, uh, sometimes called Ahura or Ara Mazda, uh, very many, very many names, as you can imagine. But what happens under Darius is that in the old Persian inscriptions, he uses uh, Ahura Mazda very much as this, uh, as this kind of uh, divine ultimate god and the giver of kingship. Uh, so Ahura Mazda takes the center role as the prime deity of the Achaemenids. So looking a bit at the uh, uh, kind of the lineage of Darius and Cyrus, the first thing you'll notice is that Cyrus, uh, who is here, Cyrus II, is of a different uh, line from Darius. Now, what we have here, uh, depicted here, is the essentially the lineage that Darius uh, the first gives us. So we don't know if this is actually true, and it probably wasn't. Uh, and there are a lot of stories about how Darius exactly came to power. So the inscription of Bisotun, uh, of which we'll get to pretty shortly, as I mentioned, uh, relates that after Cambyses II, so the son of Cyrus II, uh, killed his brother Bardia, uh, he goes on campaign in Egypt. And while Cambyses is gone in Egypt doing his kingly duties, an evil magi or magian named Gaumata comes in and imitates Bardia. So he basically takes on the role of Bardia uh, as the next in line for the kingship. Now Cambyses dies uh, and essentially uh, as the Bizutun inscription relates, Darius realizes this deceit of Gaumata and kills him and thus brings the throne, the Achaemenid throne, back to that royal blood. Uh, Herodotus also has this really odd, odd story about um, how Darius and some other nobles uh, basically face the sun and the rising sun and whoever's horse neighs first uh, becomes king and there's a very graphic story about how Darius's horse neighs first. Uh, you can easily find it online. It's both very odd and kind of funny. Um, but the truth of the matter is that Darius I probably assassinated Bardia as Cambyses was on campaign. Uh, and basically, um, Cambyses dies and Darius uh, claims power and simultaneously invents this kind of shared ancestor uh, of the name Achaemenes to give legitimacy to his claim to the throne. 
Uh, but basically, at any rate, the line of Darius uh, more closely was more closely related to central farce than to Anshan uh, of Cyrus's line, uh, and it basically becomes the sole house that ruled the empire until the coming of Alexander. So these, in the inscriptions of Darius, he says that his ancestor Hystaspes, Arsamis, Ariaramnes, Tyspes, Achaemenes, I, we don't know if these were actual figures, uh, but what we do know is that Darius in his Bissetun inscription essentially uh, claims these figures all draw him and Cyrus back to this shared emp uh, people um, of Achaemenes and Tyspes. So looking a little bit more to this development of that royal titulature, his titles that he takes on, uh, Cyrus, of course, he has this king of the four quarters, king of Anshan, very much beholden to the Babylonian tradition of kingship, of which the Elamite line also kind of held to. Uh, so this broader Neo-Babylonian style that uh, Cyrus was coming out of. But Darius, comes in at a basically a whole new angle to this and really takes on the idea of this worldly, uh, world ruling divine king. Uh, at Bissetum, his uh, basically epitaph is I am Darius, great king, king of kings, king of Persia, king of all lands. At Susa, a site which we have seen before and a site which becomes very important for the Achaemenids, uh, he takes on Darius, great king, king of kings, king of all lands, king in this earth. So basically talking about how he is the king of everything. Now at Nakshirustam, which is the final inscription of Darius, of which his tomb is located at, uh, he takes on not being king of all lands, king uh, in this he also says that he is the king in this great far-reaching earth. So he really brings on the whole notion uh, for his, uh, his final inscription that he is basically the greatest king. He rules over everything. And we'll see this more and more throughout the, the other inscriptions of how exactly uh, he brings in this idea of a universal kingship, of king over the universe. So as we can definitely imagine, uh, what we're seeing with Darius's inscriptions are very similar to what we're seeing in the Avesta. Uh, so here as this uh, in part of this inscription says, uh, he reestablished the kingdom from its foundation. Uh, he makes the sanctuaries again. So very similar to what we saw in the Cyrus Cylinder. So he's basically uh, taking on what we have in the Avesta, that idea of restoration, renovation of the post-apocalyptic world, and taking the ideas from Cyrus, uh, the, the kind of uh, royal prerogative of Cyrus to, to remake sanctuaries. Uh, so he's pulling in both the Cyrus side and the Zoroastrian side and melding them into a kind of unified narrative. So he comes, he, uh, he returns the, the household slaves and the herds and the pastures, so very much similar to what we saw with the Cyrus Cylinder again. Uh, and of course, uh, Persia plays a very important role. So he basically uh, puts in all of his inscriptions, Persia comes first. Persia being Parsa, the province, uh, and that is the center of the world, according to the Achaemenids. And with just how much land they controlled, it really is the center of the world. So looking a little bit more at that, we can see a bit of continuity between what we have uh, with Darius's inscriptions and what we see in the Avesta. So we have this idea of this great god, Ahura Mazda, creating the earth, the sky, man, happiness, I, and who made Darius the king. So we see those, those elements again with the waters, the plants, the animals, and the human I, being repeated in the Avesta, and then of course also in Middle Persian inscriptions which come later on during the Sasanian period. So what's really interesting here is that I, essentially Darius makes it so that he is one of those fundamental creations 
of the earth is that everything that exists uh, on the earth, so the sky, the waters, the animals, the land itself, Darius is one of those things. So he is not only saying that he has just been given the divine kingship, so not like Gudea of Lagash, uh, where he was kind of a, a ruler instead of the god. Here, Darius himself was one of those fundamental primordial creations uh, in his own mind. So he's really, really taking on this idea of this divinely inspired and divinely mandated kingship. Looking then a little bit more uh, is something that we saw a little bit um, previously in our Avestan discussion, but this idea of the royal fortune or the royal glory. Now, this is something that is needed to uh, essentially uh, become a king. Uh, in Avestan, it's Vanera, uh, in Middle Persian, Khara, and New Persian, Far. Uh, so you, you'll hear Far quite a, quite a lot because it's, a, it's a, still a very well-used term. But this idea of this, this royal fortune is something that if the king does not have, they are not fit to be king. And as we'll see later on in the Sasanian period, uh, essentially, you have to have this perfected body and in addition to being given the royal glory. So if you were ever to be mutilated, uh, and it's a very common thing for the Sasanians to, to mutilate uh, usurpers to the throne or pretenders to the throne, uh, if you're mutilated, you no longer have a perfect body and the royal glory or royal fortune uh, basically will not want to inhabit you. Uh, and I basically, we see this also manifested as a hawk. So uh, in this uh, Sasanian story, uh, Sasanian story on the um, kind of the, the coming of Ardashir to his kingship, uh, he follows a hawk into the distance. Uh, it also appears as a ram. So it's both uh, not only this kind of um, ethereal idea of kingship, but it's also kind of a, a divine entity in and of itself as to where it can be manifested as a physical object. Uh, and we'll also see that this idea of Huara or Hwanera uh, is something that is also connected with the royal diadem, so that ring. Uh, and we saw this a little bit with the Akkadians and with the uh, Assyrians uh, in slightly different forms, but this eventually becomes uh, this ring, uh, as I said way back when, uh, this ring essentially becomes something that is very much a symbol of kingship throughout the entire Near East and Western Asia. Now, another very interesting thing is this Kavyan glory. Uh, and this, again, speaks to kind of that idea of those primordial Iranian kings. Uh, Kawi Hosrari uh, is one of those primordial kings. Um, and we see some plays uh, into this idea, especially in the Sasanian period, uh, this plays into the idea that these Iranian kings are the direct ancestors of these Kavian kings. Uh, and they uh, later in Middle Persian become uh, Kayanid. Uh, but we'll see that definitely uh, later on. But it again, it it's appears that it's probably working in the Achaemenid period as well as this idea of connecting themselves to this, uh, this glorious Iranian past. So getting into the actual kind of material and visual culture aspect, uh, of this part of the lecture, there are some really important questions that we, we need to think about. Uh, the first is how do cultures interact in the ancient world? Perhaps it's very much so like today as to where, you know, traders come, traders being the internet, um, uh, traders come and interact with you there, warfare happens, I, it really is something that we don't know a lot about, particularly with those who weren't of the royal classes. I, a lot of the material, as I said, 
all the way back during the Egyptian lectures is that a lot of the material we have left to us comes from the upper echelons of society. So we're getting a very narrow view into the, uh, the inner workings of the entire cultural system. But what we can think of it for here is the idea of the imperial center, uh, particularly with the idea that those at the center of the empire, so the highest ranking officials and the king uh, himself, are the ones that are, are bringing in these different styles. So they're taking styles from different cultures and bringing them in. They're changing them. They're, uh, they're inventing their own styles, and those are being exported to other cultures. So it's a very much I uh, just like I uh, very much just like today, where we have uh, these kind of one specific type of culture, say the blue jean, becomes basically preeminent across the entire world. And it started off as a, a clothing for miners in California and eventually becomes this worldwide phenomena associated with America. So the next question is, how does an empire create a unified visual culture? And following in with that is, how does art and architecture serve to, to basically create this unity? Now, as we'll see with the Achaemenids, I uh, basically, they take in all of these different styles. So from Assyria, from Babylon, uh, as we saw in the last lecture from, uh, from Greece, as to where they take all of these things and bring them in and make them their own. And now it becomes something that is essentially understandable across all of these different cultures. And particularly after uh, these images had been disseminated into the broader empire, uh, they become a visual culture in and of themselves. Is that they're no longer they no longer become elements, these individual elements taken piecemeal from different places, but essentially become a unified Achaemenid style. And of course, you can replace Achaemenid with any other type of culture. But for the purposes of us is that this idea that we have all of these different styles coming in, uh, being reformed and reinterpreted, and then being sent back out is something that we can definitely uh, think of for how this works. Now, the, the final question, this problem of legitimization and divine order, uh, that comes as well with this idea of creating a unified visual culture. So we spoke a bit about how the, uh, the Zoroastrians uh, and from the Avesta really, really thought about this idea of this unified paradisical landscape. And with this, I, we can see this kind of reinterpreted through the art is that by having this unified system of art, we're basically uh, creating this idea of of a unified culture that is then able to, to, by proxy, bring about more good to the world. So by having ordered reliefs and ordered buildings, uh, they're essentially recreating in the micro scale this idea of the post-apocalyptic ordered world. And I understand this is this is obviously, you know, very fluid and kind of very fuzzy and at times very confusing and as it probably should be it is a very confusing uh thing but what we can really take away uh from these questions and the these questions that i want you to think about as we get through this lecture and the next lecture are particularly what specific elements are you seeing in the objects we're looking at that kind of give you a sense of this unified artistic prog uh, program or kind of this idea of this 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 visual culture that has then been uh, kind of basically melded into a single visual culture so from the disparate to the singular uh, and particularly with how does this art and architecture uh, serve to uh, create this unified visual culture so moving on a little bit, we talked about how it was impossible for Cyrus to write those inscriptions at Pasargadae, claiming that he was an Achaemenid. Well, this is why, is because Darius I created 
the alphabet, the syllabary for Aryan, so Old Persian. Uh, and as you can see it here, this is an inscription from Persepolis, of which we will get to in a long bit. But essentially, you can see that this is the language of which he created using cuneiform, something we've already seen time and time and time and time again, uh, in the language of, of the, the writing system of the entire Western Asia. Uh, but here, Darius created it himself to further those goals of that Aryan heritage, that Iranian heritage, by having their own writing system to reflect the language that they spoke. It makes it the preeminent, that the, the primary language of the empire. And as we'll see, it wasn't the only language of the empire, but it was that the, the, the royal language. So think of, say, if the queen in England spoke English from, you know, 1700, uh, which I don't know, maybe she is that old, so she probably does speak the language from 1700. But think that her speaking that and then, you know, everyone else around, just like America is a melting pot of all of these different languages. We don't have an official language. Same with the Achaemenids is that they did, Old Persian wasn't the official language of the Achaemenid Empire, but it was the language of the royal elite. So three phases exist of, that we can essentially see of Darius's uh, artistic and architectural program. So the first phase is his rock relief and inscriptions at a site called the Bizutum uh, in Old Persian Bagastana. Uh, and this is important, this Bagastana, because it translates roughly to place of the gods. Uh, so this the site is a site of religious importance uh, to the Achaemenids, and the site itself is this massive mountain uh, located on a major road that goes from Mesopotamia here, uh, down here in Mesopotamia, you see we have Babel, uh, Babylon, and it moves all the way up through uh, the modern Kerman Shah province of Iran and way up into northern Iran. And here, way down here, is Pisargadai, uh, where it says Stacher is where Persepolis is, and Susa is right up here. So we kind of know where we are, uh, but yeah, we're way up north into the very much the upper part of Iran. And of course, as I said, it was located on a major road, so it was visible from anyone that was traveling through and moving through the empire. They were able to see this ginormous inscription. It's absolutely massive. And here are some pretty pictures of Bisatun for you. I think that they're, uh, I really love this Flandin. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Look at the little birds and you can see a little camel. Uh, anyway, uh, pretty pictures for you to look at. And Voyage en Pers is a uh, amazing text, uh, so definitely read it if you can. And I think there is an English translation out there, but I'm not positive. So looking then to the inscription itself, it should look roughly familiar. It may be familiar from some of the other things that we've seen, and I definitely think, take some time right now to think about what uh, is familiar about this. So here we have this winged disc with a man appearing out of it, holding a ring, hint. Uh, we have Darius himself right here, holding his hand up in a sign of prayer uh, and kind of subservience. And down here we have this defeated enemy with hilariously with his arms up like this. Uh, it looks kind of funny, but a defeated enemy nonetheless with a spear bearer, the royal spear bearer, an incredibly important position as we have seen uh, with the cup bearers down in the Acadians. Uh, and we have another uh, bow bearer. Uh, and this is kind of funny because uh, Darius also holds his own bow and we have his uh, a bow carrier as well. So this was kind of a typified image for those two important people, the spear bearer and the bow carrier. Uh, but the bow for the Achaemenids was this incredibly powerful uh, sign of their military might. And 
What's really fascinating is that the Achaemenids uh, used this recurve bow. So if any of you have done archery before, you know the you know the style of the recurve bow. Well, this bow was so much more powerful than what was being used by their enemies at the time. So the enemies had just kind of the standard bow, and the recurve was essentially able to be shrunk down to have the same power as a massive bow. And this really was one of those, those major uh, uses that the Achaemenids uh, used to great effect because, well, they controlled from Egypt all the way up into modern Turkmenistan. So we'll also see that we have uh, these figures here who are bound behind their back with a rope carrying along their whole neck. And those are uh, each included with an inscription above them that says uh, who exactly they are. Uh, and of course, these are written in cuneiform. Uh, and you'll see that each of these figures are completely different from the other. They all have their own individual style of dress. They all have uh, their own hairstyle. Uh, and that goes along with the inscription saying who they were. And you'll notice that um, even some of them have similar robes to what uh, Darius himself is, uh, is wearing. Uh, but what's really fascinating about this is that we've seen these types of motifs uh, before, this idea of the defeated enemies coming before the king. So what we saw in the Assyrian palace of Ashurnasirpal, uh, this idea of like, the total and utter destruction of these enemies. And we've also seen it in Egypt. So that idea that uh, of those defeated enemies of the different lands uh, coming to the pharaoh. So this is very much part of the, the broader visual culture of the ancient world. So looking at a line drawing, uh, this one's particularly interesting because you can see that uh, the different languages used in the inscription. So I uh, was really really lovely here is that so we have old Persian that as uh, you can see here uh, just barely is that there's script uh, cuneiform script here and this runs all the way down you can see it a little bit better in some of the later images but there's old Persian all around but also Elamite and Babylonian are used in these inscriptions to basically have this multilingual inscription that multiple different peoples can read so as I mentioned Old Persian wasn't something that was was spread throughout the empire and everyone had to speak it. Uh, it wasn't the official language. So people were still speaking Elamite. People were still, still speaking Babylonian. Uh, so essentially, this these inscriptions were meant for everyone to be able to read. Now, just next to the site, uh, just a little bit farther away, I think it's, it's maybe like five miles away, is the site of Sarepole Zahab. Uh, and this is very near Bizatun, but this relief coming from the Lulubi, so around 2000 BCE, uh, and these were the people that were mentioned uh, in the Naram Sin victory stele, uh, were those same, very same people. But this rock relief here, located very close, has very much those similar elements. So we have something that is close to what we saw with the Akkadians, these naked, defeated fellas. But we also have this idea of those people tied behind their back and uh, being uh, held subservient to the king. And looking at a comparison between these two, you can very much see a lot of those similarities, uh, especially how you see here this man is the, the king, so there is a bit of differentiation in the execution of the people. Uh, but again, they're still, they're bound behind their back, they're processing to the king. We have this defeated enemy here, and a um, Akkadian style, so just like that Tondo mold that we saw however long ago, uh, this idea of people being led by their nose, and we could even draw a parallel all the way back to the palette of Narmer, which we have that same thing where the, the Horus hawk was holding on to the string with his hand that then went in and hooked the person no, person's nose. So very much drawing on this, this wide iconographic culture that is then being brought in to the Lulubi who are located uh, in the area, the same area that the Bisotun relief was created in. 
Now, one of the really fascinating things about this is that uh, the text itself was spread uh, throughout the empire. So on line 70 of this inscription, uh, Darius states that he had copies and translations circulated through all the provinces of his empire. So uh, what we have here is a fragment of an Aramaic copy, which was a later copy. So this one is about 420 BCE uh, and was a copy of one disseminated around 520 BCE uh, that was done in stone. But this one is in Aramaic, uh, the language of kind of the, the general trade language as we spoke about uh, at the start of this section, however many days ago it was now. But this really shows the dissemination of that royal narrative. So the idea of creating a unified ideology that was spread across the empire. And this inscription, the one, the entire inscription uh, from the old Persian one was sent across this whole empire and talked about those very same things that we, that we ourselves spoke about just before with the idea that Darius went and killed this usurper to the throne, Gaumata, the Magian. Uh, so that narrative was then spread about to everyone. And of course, the people in you know far off Egypt aren't gonna know the specifics of that Darius probably killed uh, Bardia uh, to gain the throne for himself. That just wasn't something that was known. Uh, you know, think about uh, back in the day and when, you know, no one really knew all of the random people didn't know the whole entire life story of George Washington. Uh, so very much similar to what uh, what was going on uh, during the time of George Washington, similar type of thing going on here. Now, what's really interesting is that the inscription was circulated via all of these copies, but the text on the monument itself was entirely illegible. I, there, as you can see, this is the remnants. All of these little dots are part of the old Persian inscription. So it's absolutely massive. It even continues on over here. But just this huge inscription that is so high up in the air that it's impossible to read. Uh, so it basically has this very interesting kind of uh, way for, for Darius to continue his legacy and the narrative of his, his rise to power into the future through the use of the living rock itself. So it's not so much that someone was able to read the text, but just that the text was there in order for it to have that certain sort of efficacy. So again, I said that we could um, speak about a little bit about this uh, this tondo, this fragment uh, for a mold, uh, and this kind of has that same idea as the dissemination of all of the different parts of the text. Is that it's this this use of a mold makes that image repeatable and spreadable. So how just as uh, probably uh, Naram Sin here with Ishtar, this image was spread throughout uh, the Akkadian Empire uh, to showcase his Naram Sin's martial prowess and his uh, divine authority given by Ishtar. Same things happening with Darius's inscription that was disseminated throughout the empire. He was able, through the use of uh, this uh, kind of replicative method, uh, to be able to, to send out the image. So what Darius is doing isn't new. It's something that has happened before. And as we saw uh, earlier, that we have this kind of used, this, this idea of visual culture, this, these, these everlasting ideas that keep popping up and up and up again. Uh, so not only do we have this idea of spreading this royal narrative, but also the use of previously used uh, iconographic elements to be able to, to, to make your message. Now I said that this winged disc should look familiar and we can of course compare it to that Assyrian re relief of Ashur with uh, Ashurnasirpal uh, on the other side of this tree of life symbolism and basically we have a very similar thing, this winged disc 
with uh, this lovely plumed tail and these beautifully waving uh, with these little whorls, these wings and feathers, very, very similar between these two and even with the man appearing on the inside. So I said that uh, when we talked about the Assyrians that this wing disc would be important and here you can see it. Now here are of course some other ones that we've seen before. So again that uh, relief of Ashur from the uh, Ashurnasirpal. We have another one here with the bow. We have him hunting and another one that uh, we just really didn't look at uh, from Egypt, but another symbolism from Egypt that has a very long lineage all the way into the Old Kingdom, uh, particularly under Sneferu, uh, is this winged disc image here. Uh, and this occurs from Medinet Habu, so we spoke a little bit about that um, during the Egyptian section. But here we have that same type of motif as that, that solar disc that then has its wings along it. And that's continued into the Akkadian and the Assyrian period. Uh, and all the way into the old Persian, uh, the Achaemenid period as well. So it's very much a motif that is drawn across all of these different cultures. So Akkadian, Egyptian, and Assyrian that are then used into the uh, old Persian culture. So I spoke a little bit at the beginning of this and uh, at the beginning of this lecture, uh, the idea of lie versus truth. So. What's really fascinating about this is that um, we have later on uh, during the uh, Sasanian period is that uh, they were the most trustworthy people to make a contract with because they believed ultimately in the truth and lying was a supremely evil act. So for the Achaemenids, uh, the lying itself was this horrible thing to do, as it is today. You shouldn't lie. Lying is bad. It's easier to tell the truth. But for the Achaemenids, lying was basically giving power to the evil forces. So exactly uh, inimical to the good deeds and good work that they were trying to do. So by creating those little slices of paradise on earth, by telling a lie, you would essentially chip away at that and make the earth worse and more evil uh, and make it so that the, the, the um, evil forces win. Uh, and this really kind of uh, comes along with the idea of Darius, particularly with the Scythians. So the, the Scythians who were the pointy cap people, let's see if we can get to an image of them. So this fella here with his amazingly pointed cap, I essentially what happens is that uh, Darius says that the Scythians were vulnerable to the lie. So he essentially gives himself uh, a way to, um, to justify his uh, attack of the Scythian states uh, by saying that they were, were vulnerable to lying and thus agents of evil. Uh, and the Scythians, uh, their actual, um, the, the structure or the, the figure itself was added at a later date to, to basically bring them in to, to one of the defeated lands. So added them in as a defeated land and basically uh, Darius says that they were vulnerable to lie to the lie uh, in order to make it so he wasn't just seeming as a guy going out and attacking, he was going and bringing order and good and truth to the world by attacking these uh, nomadic people who were vulnerable to the lie. So as kind of the, uh, the last thing that we can take away from the, the Bissotun relief is the ultimate power of Darius over his enemies. And uh, as this inscription from Naqshe Rustam, so his tomb monument, uh, as kind of the final epitaph of him is that the Persian man has, it should say pushed, I'll fix that. He has not bushed anyone, <laughs> well maybe he has. It should say, <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he pushed back the enemy from Persia. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, and this is really the idea of Persia being that primary space of, uh, of the Achaemenids. And he pushed back the enemies, the people prone to the lie away from that good land. Uh, and you can really just, if you search Bisotun on uh, Google Images, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. And we will come back to Bisotun at the very end of the semester because there is this wonderful unfinished relief uh, that's located there. But I digress. We should get on to phase B, the second phase. So here, after uh, things settle down for the Achaemenids, uh, they've expanded their empire uh, greatly, uh, Darius begins construction of his palace at Persepolis. Uh, and the Darius Persepolis uh, A inscription, so that's DPA, states that he built this residence here that none had uh, built before. God, I am full of spelling errors today. I apologize. Uh, but essentially, it's built out of a completely brand new spot. I, nothing had been built there before, uh, and archaeological evidence relatively does attest to that, is that this was a brand new foundation. Uh, he adds uh, a lot of embellishment to the site of Persepolis, uh, and he adds these Median and Persian soldiers who are guarding the gateways, uh, as we'll see. Uh, and we have these royal hero motifs that come from the private parts of the palaces, uh, and those are quite interesting, so we'll get to those. Uh, and at Susa, a site that we have talked about many a time before, uh, he comes in and creates his own palace and has these massive glazed brick I, um, walls put in that are absolutely fascinating, and we will talk a little bit more about them. So he builds this massive palace, as you can see, this Apadana mound, uh, and I basically constructs this palace uh, ex novo, so out of nothing, so very much similar to uh, Persepolis. Uh, but of course, Susa had been a city before, uh, and there were some remnants of earlier uh, pieces here uh, from the Elamites and the uh, Assyrians. But uh, essentially, a lot of this gets almost completely redone and becomes the site of the royal city of Susa for the Achaemenids. Now, what's really fascinating is that there are no archaeological remains dating to the Achaemenid period uh, anywhere outside of this Propyleum and the Apadana Mound. The rest of this part of the city was completely and utterly uh, abandoned. Uh, there was nothing there uh, until the Seleucid period. So this is the, uh, this gray is the extent of the Seleucid city. But the Achaemenids had no housing, so no permanent housing. And this probably relates to uh, the tent city that we know of that the Achaemenids utilized. So there was a tent city that was for the all of the administrative uh, people. So everyone below the actual king and his immediate people uh, himself uh, were located basically in a tent. And the Achaemenid court essentially moved around. I, all of these cities that we're going to be looking at, so Susa, um, Ecbatana, Babylon, um, and Persepolis are basically these massive administrative centers that were used for the collection of taxes. They were essentially run by a skeleton crew uh, of administrative staff, and the royal court would move through these different things depending on if they were on campaign or if it was summer or winter. There's very much summer palaces and winter palaces uh, to be able to keep, maintain a nice uh, temperature. But Susa is again one of those cities. So it has this massive Apadana mound, but basically becomes um, this administrative center. Now looking at the Apadana Mount, and uh, this is one of those vocabularies that you should definitely know is Apadana, and that is the Persian term for hypostyle hall. We've seen the hypostyle halls before, but this Apadana idea is this hypostyle hall with the surrounding porticos. And I uh, basically of this palace are the two our two major sections. We have this massive hypostyle hall, 
uh, which is connected on the north side to this very much this courtyard structure of which we've seen uh, before. We can, of course, compare this to the Babylonian and Assyrian city types uh, that is very much belongs um, to this larger tradition. Uh, notice also we have this detached gatehouse, so very much, very, very similar to what we see at Pasargadai. Uh, and this is referred to, uh, in the inscriptions, the city is referred to as Frasha, so that wonder idea, that kind of post-apocalyptic wonder. Now, um, it's also set on a massive terrace, so very similar to what we saw at uh, Dur Sharokin with the Assyrians. So again, using all of these different uh, disparate elements all coming into a single unified structure. So the foundation inscription uh, that was found uh, on the Apadana Mound uh, is really one of those massively impressive things. Uh, it has praise of Ahura Mazda and these elements that went into the construction of the site. So cedar, uh, a specific type of word, uh, wood from Gandhara, so from uh, modern India. Uh, gold, lapis lazuli, carnelian, those should be familiar from Babylon. Uh, we have silver and ebony, ornamentation, ivory, columns, actual humans themselves and the stone cutters, the goldsmiths, um, the people who brought the wood the, itself, uh, the men who made the baked brick, and the men who decorated the wall. Uh, all of these things coming together, both actual physical objects and human objects, all coming together to construct the, the palace itself. So it's the expanse of the empire is all brought in to construct uh, this singular palace. And we can, of course, think about this in very many ways. Uh, it shows the power of the empire to extract and control, and control resources. It uh, is creating that microcosm of the empire, like we saw at Pasargadai. Uh, and it's also one of these things in which uh, by building the palace, using all of these different, these materials from all around the empire and these men from all around the empire, it kind of shows uh, in a way that the, the kind of royal palace, the, the, all of the palace institution is a good word for it. All of those things associated with the palace can't be uh, built and can't exist without the help of all of the people in the empire. So again, creating kind of that unified system is that everyone is needed to be able to create the empire itself. So really some, some, some very interesting things to, to think on here. I, looking at these glazed bricks, these should of course be very familiar. They're taken uh, directly from that Babylonian precedent. Uh, and by the time that Susa was constructed, Babylon was already under the heel of the Kanduni kingship. Uh, and we can really see that we have a, a very much so a Persian motif that is executed in this kind of international style using uh, styles from, uh, from the uh, Neo-Babylonians and from the Assyrians and of course the Ionians of which had come in uh, under Cyrus. So one definitely what we can see from the Assyrians is are these, uh, this lovely glazed brick motif here. Uh, this is a uh, Lamasu from Dur Sharokin. Uh, and what we have here is these two kind of Lamasu esque creatures, uh, very much executed with a uh, Persian physiognomy. Uh, so, very Persian features in the eyes and the nose. This uh, lion creature is very much beholden to Persian precedent, especially of what we saw at um, Pasargadai. Uh, and, but you can see how we have that, uh, the idea of the beard and the world hair behind is definitely drawing uh, directly from the Lamasu, the Assyrian Lamasu. Again, even these horns and this kind of chef's hat. Um, and of course we have this winged disc, which is executed very similarly to what we saw in Egypt 
So from that, uh, the MetaNet Habu uh, relief that we saw, very similar. So it's lacking uh, the human coming out of it. Uh, the wings are very much more um, executed in a realistic style. A bit of naturalism is being brought in. Uh, so what we're seeing at SUSE is kind of this first iteration of what um, Darius was trying to, to portray his kingdom as through art and architecture. So the final phase of Darius, phase C, is that he constructs the Apadana at Persepolis, that the main audience hall, the Tuchara, which is his private apartments. Uh, he constructs the treasury um, and has two reliefs, uh, kingly reliefs uh, depicting Xerxes I as the crown prince. Uh, we also see an Egyptian style statue that was found at Susa, and he has his uh, rock cut tomb at Nakhcherustan, which I mentioned earlier, and this Ashler Tower, this Kabye Zardusht. Uh, we will think uh, you'll see how it's uh, very interesting. I, I, I warned you about it, but it's a, it's a very interesting thing. So, first, just a little reminder of that Assyrian architecture. Uh, looking at Durshar Keen, we have that terrace, this terraced kind of structure here uh, in which the palace sits on. We have these multiple courtyards leading into a throne room. Very much something we've seen time and time again, uh, but it is, you know, uh, something that is very familiar to us. But as we'll see with Persepolis, that is basically thrown out the window. Uh, that idea of architecture and architectural organization is basically completely gone. Instead, we have this whole new iteration of kingly architecture built on a massive terrace that was completely and utterly made by hand. So here is the edge of the mountain and this entire terrace, which as we'll see in uh, some images later on is well and truly high above the ground. So it's uh, the amount of labor that went into it. Uh, and here are some important things. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, the Apadana and this palace of Darius here, the Tachara. Uh, and in the next lecture we will look at uh, the rest of these structures here. Uh, you'll notice uh, one, a detached gatehouse from the main palatial complex, so very much continuing on with that uh, theme. Uh, here are just some lovely uh, views from uh, the tomb of Artaxerxes III, so that's right up here, so we're standing about right here. You can see these lovely views, you can see down into the hundred column hall, uh, here is the Apadana itself, also raised up on its own terrace. Uh, this is that detached gatehouse, and then you look off into the Marv Dasht plain. Uh, so this massive plain, and one of the only, you have to come through here to be able to get up into um, deeper into the Iranian highlands. And here we're looking back, we can see the, um, the harem of Xerxes, the tripylon, which is located right here. Uh, again, the hundred column hall. Uh, going back into the treasury uh, and Xerxes palace uh, and you can again see off into the distance and what's really fascinating is that this little structure here it's a massive tent uh, and it comes from uh, the reign of Reza, Reza Shah Pahlavi who was um, the, the last king of Iran before the Islamic revolution and they held a massive um, ceremony here to celebrate 2,500 years since Cyrus, uh, since the foundation of the Iranian Empire, since Cyrus the Great. And uh, the uh, Islamic, uh, the Ayatollahs, after the um, after the coming of the Islamic Revolution, uh, the Ayatollahs let the tent city decay as its own um, kind of a monument to the excesses of the Pahlavi regime. So looking a little bit more, you can see here is a uh, aerial view of the site of Persepolis. Uh, again, obviously largely in ruins, but you can see some of the correlation here. Um, absolutely fascinating site. It's truly incredible. Uh, here, I said we would see a little bit more from Persepolis 3D, and here it is. Uh, this is a very accurate reconstruction of the site of Persepolis. And you'll notice uh, we have this massive Apadana 
the 100 column hall, this uh, detached gateway here, uh, the fortification wall that runs all the way up the mountain, the Kuiramat, uh, and comes back down and you can see this open plain below and this adorst, this double adorst staircase that runs up in uh, a central open spot. Uh, absolutely um, just massive architecture as you'll uh, see as we get along on this. Um, here again, just another view for you to look at. Um, again, we're going to be looking at the Apadana and the Palace of Darius. So here is the entrance to the structure. Uh, as you can see, it is a absolutely massive terrace. It absolutely dwarfs uh, the surrounding landscape. And as you can imagine, if the terrace itself is this tall, the buildings are even taller than this. So it's just this huge structure that could be seen basically from out the entirety of the Margdash Plain. So here again is a reconstruction of the entrance uh, with this adorse, this double adorse staircase uh, leading up into the, the entrance hall, the gate of all lands as it's called, uh, and just uh, how it exists today. So an absolutely massive site. Uh, here, here, this image comes from the Ernst Herzfeld archive uh, at the Smithsonian Institution, and this is before the excavation of the Oriental, Oriental Institute in the 1930s. Uh, as you can see, um, just the amount of uh, labor that went into clearing out this entire structure. Uh, and this really gives a good view of just the amount of just insanely beautiful reliefs that were put onto uh, these um, the terrace of the Apadana itself. Uh, you can see some uh, a lot of the information here. So we have uh, these tribute bearers that are all coming along. We'll get uh, we'll talk more about these in the next lecture. But there's tribute bearers who are all coming and bringing tribute to the king. Uh, we have a lion here attacking a horse or a zebra. Uh, very uh, martial scene itself. We have these uh, very interesting papyrus, acanthus, lotus blossoms that are repeated as they come down. And you can see the massive columns of the hypostyle hall, the Apadana, uh, rising up into the, uh, into the sky. And on the backside is that palace of Darius the Tachara. So the column types that were included at Persepolis uh, are, should look relatively familiar, especially this one here. This, uh, essentially this, this kind of lotus type column is, draws directly on what's coming out of Egypt. So uh, we're getting that same type of idea coming from Egypt use, uh, used in the columns. And they're then uh, kind of essentially uh, mixed in with these ionic volutes. So from the ionic order of columns, uh, so these scroll-like things uh, are being brought in. And we're kind of seeing this mixture of, uh, of different architectural styles all brought into the um, into a singular column. And these were used to hold up massive roof beams uh, on the uh, <coughs> of the Apadana. And you can see uh, here as standard column, you can see where the roof beam would sit, but they would sit between these adorsed bulls and griffins. Uh, and they were carved out specifically to be able to hold up these massive roof beams. And you can see that here uh, with the north portico uh, coming in and uh, yes, they, they, uh, one of the things that, that uh, you'll see a lot of these images is that the, the surviving reliefs are just this black limestone, but they were, uh, there's evidence that they were brilliantly painted into bright blue and greens and golds. So mimicking what we see with the glazed bricks uh, at Susa and of course Babylon, they were mimicking that with paint here at Persepolis. So a continuation of that idea of uh, using these other people's styles to create your own style. And this really just gives you an idea of how absolutely massive it was. You can see the little tiny people here uh, with these massive columns. It's just absolutely uh, incredible how large it is. And uh, at roughly the same time, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the uh, Artemision, was constructed. Uh, and I, these two kind of seven wonders, uh, the uh, Temple of Artemis was one of those seven wonders of the ancient world. 
uh, and uh, roughly the same size as what we saw at Persepolis. Um, so we're seeing monumental structures being built uh, all across the world. And of course, uh, what's going on at this time in Ephesus is the Achaemenids control it. Uh, so it's part of Achaemenid lands. Uh, and it, this massive structure is being built um, under their uh, tutelage. So here is an image just of those uh, double capitals. They're absolutely uh, massive. Uh, you would come up to about here on them. So they're, you know, roughly human sized uh, or animal sized, I guess. Uh, but yes, you can see how they were cut perfectly flat on top to be able to hold um, the, uh, the roof beams. Um, and here we have this very uh, terrifying griffin. Uh, I was going to have that as my background of looking directly into the face, but it scared me a bit too much. Uh, and really one of those things um, that why I think museums are so important is because you can get a sense of scale of some of these objects. Uh, so here is a picture that I took um, and it's the camera is roughly at the height of my head and I'm five nine or five ten I think. Um, my driver's license says 510, but I don't think that's true. Um, but yeah, so this is absolutely massive. You can see a person here kind of standing by it. So these things were carved by hand and then lifted into the air and placed on top. And then these massive roof beams were then placed on top of that. And we also can see on the uh, entrance to the tomb of Artaxerxes III, which is just up above Persepolis uh, is these, uh, again, these used as engaged columns using the exact same style. And again, just a couple of other views here, uh, just for your enjoyment to, to see how amazing it is, definitely go to Persepolis 3D because it is incredible. Uh, looking then at the Palace of Darius, the Tachara, located back here behind the Apadana itself. Uh, you can see the ground plan, again, a replication of that um, uh, columned hall type, that hypostyle hall, but with these kind of interior rooms. Uh, and what's kind of interesting to think uh, is that these weren't places for living. We don't really have any evidence of living quarters at Persepolis. It was largely a ceremonial and administrative capital, as it was essentially a place in which the king would come and do some ceremonial duties and then go on his merry way to his next place. Um, so it was, uh, a lot of these were built um, basically just to show the power of the king. And on these, uh, these doorways um, are multiple different reliefs. You'll notice that we have this uh, Caveto Cornice, uh, very much drawing on those earlier precedents. We could even make a comparison with the, um, the Mastaba of T with his Caveto Cornices and some of the others in Egypt that we saw. Uh, but these are just massive carved lintels. And this is something that I want you to just um, be aware of. Uh, particularly the style of this Caveto cornice is you have the cornice here and then this door jam that reduces in in three steps. I just want you to, to keep that in the back of your mind for when we get to the Sasanian period. Now these uh, two reliefs, there's two of them uh, that adorned uh, the Apadana um, and the Tichara. And <laughs> what it shows is that we have uh, a seated uh, Darius the first with a, uh, a person doing, uh, this is a person dressed as a Mede, so a Median, uh, and the uh, kind of giving obsolescence to the, uh, to the king. And this is a ritual symbol that hand in front of the mouth is a ritual symbol uh, which we saw uh, before, and I'll leave that to you to find it while you're studying for your midterm. Um, but you'll see here that we have uh, the crown prince, uh, Xerxes I, holding his hand, uh, just as uh, we saw with uh, Darius on his Bisatun relief. Um, and we have these uh, various courtiers behind him. Uh, all uh, We have perhaps a priest here. Uh, we have a sword bearer and then two spear bearers behind him. So looking just a little bit uh, closer, you can get some detail on the hand and we have these 
two other spear bearers on this side. And these here are little incense uh, burners. Uh, and they're really little fascinating, um, little fascinating structures. I, I really like them. Uh, and you can notice that we have the throne here with the lion's feet. And of course, Darius's feet are raised above the ground because he is an important guy. Uh, and here is just an image of those three figures behind Xerxes. Uh, you'll also notice that Xerxes himself is raised above the rest of the people by his little platform. So it goes, uh, we have Darius up on his platform uh, with his little footstool and then, uh, oh, one more, and then uh, Xerxes on his own. And what's really fascinating uh, is that uh, this is looking at this guy's sword right here. Uh, and if we zoom in on this sword, we actually have archaeological evidence from the Oxus treasure. So uh, way up in uh, north of Afghanistan uh, is this ceremonial scabbard executed in pure hammered gold with the basically the exact same reliefs as this uh, as the scabbard here uh, that's depicted on the uh, on the relief from the tachara. So incredibly interesting that we kind of have art imitating life, life imitating art, I guess. But again, I, I said that uh, some of these door jams were absolutely fascinating. And uh, here's something from the uh, Assyrian period, a uh, relief um, from the palace of Sargon II, uh, this idea of the royal hero subduing the lion. Uh, and this, is, this one's currently in the Louvre, and this one is from of the, one of the door jams in the Tachara. And we have that same sort of idea being replicated here is that we have this royal hero, this time depicted roughly as Darius I, uh, instead of what is thought as Gilgamesh. Um, we have Darius I subduing the lion, and instead of uh, holding this, this small club or snake, uh, he's holding a knife in which he's about ready to, to give the lion the, the business. Um, yeah, so we see these uh, older, again, we see these older uh, motifs and iconographies being brought in to Persepolis and reinterpreted through an Achaemenid Aryan lens. So finally, looking at the site of Naqsherustam, uh, this is a massive uh, site of the Achaemenid tombs. Uh, there are four tombs here, uh, all dating to the Achaemenid period. Uh, and this very interesting cube, I said it would be interesting. This is the uh, Kavye Zardosh, the Kaaba. So same term as the Kaaba at Mecca. Um, this Kaaba of Zoroaster, the cube of Zoroaster. Uh, and you'll also notice uh, a lot of these uh, images below, uh, you'll see these reliefs here. These date from the Sasanian period. Uh, so this image right here is taken from about right here. So the relief, uh, the tomb of Darius I is located back here. And then all of these lines, so these here and these here date to the Sasanian period. So again, using that site um, as a uh, kind of an already royal spacious site. And here we have the tomb of Darius I. And looking at it a bit closer, um, here on the inside, there were two actual uh, coffins for Darius, uh, perhaps, probably, um, and naturally they were empty because the site was looted. But you'll see that we have that uh, Coveto cornice with the uh, three-stepped jam coming in and this massive relief above. And so very similar to the same architectural style that we saw at Persepolis, but also with this dental frieze coming in from, uh, from Greece. So that was also imported, just like we saw at Pasargadai. Uh, so kind of a Greek slash Pasargadin motif. And you also see that there was essentially a reproduction of the palace facade. So you can really think of these tombs as reproduction palaces. And they were basically a palace for the afterlife uh, for the Achaemenids to be able to, to live in. 
looking at the inscription itself, and we're, uh, yeah, I know we're getting close to the end of time, but just bear with me. Uh, you'll see that all of these people are down below the main part of the relief. So they are located right here. And this is the, the main part of the reef that has the exact, basically the exact same uh, part of the, um, uh, that we saw on uh, when we were talking about the sacred precinct at Pisargadi. So Darius with his hand up on a stepped platform, a fire altar on a stepped platform, and the winged Ahura Mazda up above. But these are located below uh, all of these figures, and they're holding up the, the image above, and they are all of these different lands that Darius had subdued. So Media, Alam, Parthia, all the way to um, Maka. So Maka is modern day Oman and the Carians. So all of these different lands uh, are brought in and they hold up the empire. So just like we saw at Susa, uh, the same thing was happening here, but I'm um, shown basically with the actual people themselves holding up the empire and the king, uh, just as all of the material and the workmen created the empire. So unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. So we will come back, we will finish the time of Darius, get into Xerxes and the rest of the Achaemenids, and hopefully get to the Scythians. I didn't get through as much as I wanted to today, but it is what it is, because they're the Achaemenids, they're often, they're awesome. Uh, so stay safe. I hope uh, you have a good couple of days until the next lecture, and I will see you all on Wednesday. Have a good one. Uh...